coming up on Market to Market. The stroke of a pen unlocks an oil tap on the high plains. Snow pummels the east as floodgates open in the west. And the payback of perseverance 10 years after a devastating tornado. Those stories and market analysis with Tom Fitzenmeyer next. Sales. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, February 10 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. President Trump's executive orders and proposed policies have triggered concern among consumers and visions of positive gains among investors. Consumer sentiment fell 2.8% last month. The trade gap hit a four-year high in 2016. As Trump works to heal diplomatic relations with major trading partners like China, imports from the world's second largest economy fell slightly last month, even as overall export and import numbers moved higher. And the Dow, S&P 500 and Nasdaq spent the week in record territory as optimism continues to build as each new administration plan is rolled out. President Trump's heavy use of his signature in the first weeks of his administration has released a storm of controversy and a potential flood of oil. The stroke of a pen gave the final counterclockwise rotation of the petroleum valve on the last mile of the nation's most contentious energy project. John Torpy has the details as last-ditch legal efforts are placed in front of the bench. The Army Corps of Engineers halted environmental studies surrounding the final stretch of the Dakota Access Pipeline that crosses underneath the North Dakota Reservoir along the Missouri River. This action gives the project's developer, Dallas-based Energy Transfer Partners, the go-ahead to complete the 1,200-mile-long pipeline that spans four Midwestern states. The variance in course for the $3.8 billion oil pipeline came about in part to an executive order signed by President Trump that advances the construction of both the Dakota Access and Keystone XL pipelines. The Washington delegation from North Dakota applauded the action. However, the heavy equipment could still sit idle as opposition from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe the group responsible for months of protests against the project, have pledged to fight these latest developments in court. Energy Transfer Partners predicts oil will be flowing through the pipeline in the next three months. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. For nearly five years, parts of the nation were locked in a drought. Recent weather patterns have moved the pendulum back the other direction with a vengeance. Paul Yeager reports on what has become a weather whipsaw. The weekend started early as a strong winter storm blasted the northeast from Pennsylvania to Maine. The blizzard is likely to leave more than a foot of snow in several states. The Gulf Coast was slammed by severe storms earlier in the week. Five tornadoes struck Louisiana on Tuesday, damaging hundreds of homes in the storm's path. California may finally be emerging from a five-year drought. Heavy rain again blanketed the west in a series of Pacific storms. South of San Francisco, several mudslides were triggered after the deluge. According to the National Weather Service, the rain total in downtown Los Angeles since October, the start of the wet season, hit about 15 and a half inches and already exceeds the normal amount for an entire year. Snowdrifts in the Sierra Nevada range are 173% of average and the most since 1995. One third of the state's water supply comes from snowpack. The storms brought three fourths of the state's normal yearly precipitation in just a few weeks. Governor Jerry Brown is expected to wait until the end of the rainy season in April to decide whether to lift a drought emergency in place since 2014. This week's level in the drought monitor is the lowest nationwide since May and lowest in the Golden State since 2011. 
For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. A tornado rocked a southern Kansas town a decade ago, leaving people with the hard decision of leaving or rebuilding. Those who chose to stay have faced an uphill financial battle lasting considerably longer than the night of Mother Nature's wrath. Since then, they have endured a monetary crisis triggered by tax cut policies enacted by Governor Sam Brownback. Although cuts to school funding that plagued other districts were few and far between, fluctuating land values, among other issues, have left residents undeterred in their fight to restore their lives. Josh Bittner has our cover story. To me, it was as much a, a feeling as a sound. I mean, yes, it was roaring and it was loud, but we really could feel the earth shake. I mean, Ten years ago, Kim Gamble and her farm family sought refuge from an EF5 tornado that nearly wiped Greensburg, Kansas off the map. To see all your stuff blown all over in your house is one thing, but you go to town and you can't even find the house. So. Her husband Kai's wheat crop took a beating that year, and even though volunteers helped scour fields adding up to the size of the small town itself, random debris is still entangled within thickets nearby. For people who lost their home, lost their job, I think it was harder because their day was filled with just that sense of overwhelming, uh, what do I do next? We knew, you know, well, we got to go start the irrigation engine. So we had a little bit of that that I think helped us move down the road. Would you say that's probably right? And when you looked out the window and you could see the trains go through town and you could never see trains before, yeah. that was really weird. For decades, Greensburg's claim to fame was the world's largest hand dug well, completed in the 1800s. But the emphasis shifted in May 2007. You've been watching this for quite a little while. And what did you estimate its maximum width was? Um, I would say easily a mile, um, and that's kind of being conservative. The nighttime twister tore a 29-mile path north through Comanche County up to Greensburg, the seat of Kiowa County, 100 miles west of Wichita. Uh, we're right on the line. You're right. 205 mile per hour surface winds were reported in town. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, among the population of 1,600, 11 died and nearly 1,500 homes and businesses were either destroyed or sustained major or minor damage, a 95% loss. To many residents, the town and surrounding landscape were unrecognizable. I almost got lost in this small town because there's no landmarks, nothing standing except the elevator. Market to Market toured the devastation with Kai's father, Dean Gamble, less than 48 hours after the 2007 cyclone struck. While then President George W. Bush declared Greensburg a disaster area eligible for federal aid, the retired teacher and farmer, now deceased, surveyed his decimated home. It's a rude awakening. We thought we had our lives well intact and everything would be great. But now what? You just got to start all over again. It's hard to take. We were making a lot of decisions early on in this emotional state of mind that first six to eight months after the tornado. One year into the aftermath, the town's well-respected postmaster, Bob Dixon, was prodded by community members to run for mayor and won. Since then, he's helped shepherd the town's vision toward an environmentally proactive rehab. The concept of going green started the night after the tornado when representatives from the governor's office, our local elected officials, uh, FEMA was in town already. And the discussion started back, hey, you're going to have to rebuild the whole town. Let's make sure we do it in a right, prudent, and responsible manner. Dixon says Greensburg City Council passed a resolution to erect all new municipal buildings to meet a LEED Platinum standard, a designation certified by the U.S. Green Building Council. Greensburg City Hall used 75,000 bricks claimed from the rubble in its new structure. Other buildings followed suit, employing things like natural light, 
effective use of shade, and solar panels. Wind turbines now dot the landscape as well, helping curb the town's carbon footprint along with its electric bill. Energy efficient solutions have been encouraged across the community. The local hospital and John Deere dealership played along, as did the school system. But for some, the upfront costs were daunting. City officials grant that rebuilding green averaged around 12% above standard costs, but point to a study by the National Renewable Energy Lab, a division of the U.S. Department of Energy, which calculated up to a 40% subsequent increase in performance. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? The mayor admits a progressive push in an area traditionally skeptical of overarching change has led to bumps in the road forward. We have to remember that here in the agriculture community and throughout the Midwest and the High Plains, we're very independent people. So rules and regulations sometimes are misinterpreted as, as an infringement on our freedoms and our rights. And sometimes they are. And sometimes we use that as an excuse. Greensburg's population is still well below what it was before the tornado. For elderly citizens, rebuilding wasn't really their cup of tea. But there are hints of a younger generation putting down roots. So after $75 million in insurance payments, nonprofit funds, and government assistance have helped the town rise from the ashes, some say local investors are key to Greensburg's longevity. After you get a community wiped out and lose friends and family, it changes your whole perspective on life. The Gambles and other local producers have sunk over $1 million into the town's business incubator area, which helps local entrepreneurs keep a lid on costs as they get their operations off the ground. And along with other investments in the community, farmers turned benefactors have showcased the resilience of a town that could have become nothing more than a memory. There's people that can and do, and there's people that can but don't. And we're very fortunate that the people that can, we have a whole lot of people that do in this community to make it better, to address quality of life issues. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Even with news of record large South American crops and what traders were generally calling a nothing much WASDE report, the grain markets finished in positive territory. For the week, March wheat gained 19 cents and the nearby corn contract rode wheat's coattails 9 cents higher. March soybeans fell following the report but managed to recover, rising 32 cents for the week. March meal added 10.50 per ton. In the softs, March cotton gave back 59 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, March Class 3 milk futures fell 26 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the April cattle contract fell 248, March feeders dropped $1.50, and the April lean hog contract moved higher 83 cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 95 basis points. Crude oil put on 3 cents per barrel. COMEX gold gained $15 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly three points to finish the week at 403 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Tom Fitzenmeyer. Tom, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. We're glad to have you here. But before we get started, you can listen to our market discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast on our website, iptv.org slash mtom. Tom, let's get right into it. This week market, big move to the upside for wheat, pushing 20 cents in the nearby contract. What happened? Well, I, number one, the, the, the USDA report out Thursday um, dropped the carry out a little more than the trade was expecting. So I, that was one support. But I mean, the, the, the wheat market had started to move already. And there's been pretty good demand for, for good quality wheat. So, um, you know, the funds seem to be intent on buying really quite a bundle of commodities. You've seen them involved in all these markets. Uh, they've been fairly heavily short wheat, so uh, it doesn't take much of a short covering to, to trigger a pretty good move in wheat, and we've had that. Now, we're up close to March wheat, close to three, uh, 450, excuse me. I, I would guess 
yeah, maybe another 20, 30 cents up, probably not much more than that. It's, uh, the world wheat supplies are still more than ample, um, feed grains in general more than ample, uh, and, and wheat's starting just slightly become a bit overbought. So uh, a little carry through buying maybe next week, and then I guess you're going to start to... The, t the going is going to get a little tougher. Okay. For the first, well, for the past quarter at least, we watched that wheat trade and the dollar trade be pretty well correlated. This week, however, dollar stronger, still saw gains in wheat. Have we overcome that, uh, that mindset of strong dollar, short wheat trade? I, I think we have for a while, yeah. I, and and I, I, the other side of that is I don't see the dollar doing a whole lot here in the next I don't know, month or two until, until we kind of figure out what they or some, get some idea of the administration's policies uh, and, and tax policies and infrastructure spending and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, the dollars related quite closely to the, to the bond market mm -hmm. or T-note market. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I don't really see... I think wheat's going to trade on its own and kind of divorce itself from that a little bit. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this corn market. Another, we saw a dime added to it. Can you break down the supply and demand report for the corn market? They really didn't change all that much. They, they increased the ethanol number by about 25 million uh, bushel, which is appropriate. Eth ethanol, you know, the last five weeks has been almost every week's a new record. I guess it wasn't this week, but it was close. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think it was per pretty appropriate uh, then an upward adjustment was made. Now, it may have been a little bit bearish because some people thought they were going to increase it by 50 million and it was only 25, but, but still, the, the, the increase was there and that was a positive. Other than that, they didn't change much. The um, uh, world stocks were down a little bit, but that was mostly because they made an adjustment in, in the Chinese uh, stocks, uh, corn stocks, and, and that's always a little... You know, a little hard to say. Where, where, Take when, it with when, a grain of salt. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, um, and I think that was a part of the, the corn trade that was probably viewed as being a little bit friendly. I mean, the carryout still 2.3 plus, uh, which is a, a lot of corn. I mean, we are trying trying to chew through it, but. It's still a lot to go. On the old crop corn market, we've got up here, we're pushing that 375 mark. A lot of farmers are really would love to see that get to $4 on the old crop. Is that in the cards? I mean, you can't say no because it's certainly breaking above that last summer's high this week was was, was a positive. Almost all the technicals are pointed higher. I, I guess I'd be a little uneasy because momentum is starting to kind of get up there in the, in the, the overbought sort of range. So that could be some resistance. But but certainly it, it was a good close, pause, up up into new highs, closed you know higher on the week and all that stuff. So I, I would certainly think that next objective on March. Up at 387, okay. with the possibility of the next one at 396, uh, four bucks itself uh, may, may be tough, but those those lower two uh, are certainly a possibility. Here. All right, so that's on the old crop side. On the new crop side, we've got a question here from Lita in Fairview, Illinois. She's asking, what will give any hope of pushing prices higher this fall? That these corn contract still right there, looking at four dollars. What's gonna What's it gonna take to move that higher? Well, number number one, we've got this a, 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 a big question about what acreage is going to be. We've got that outlook meeting in February 23rd, 24th, which kind of gives us a hint. Then the then the March 31st, a little more official to, a, acreage estimate. Uh, so acreage is certainly a thing that can do it. You always have the uncertainty of weather. Um, I, again, the funds seem inclined to want to buy. Whole, obviously, they've been big buyers of beans. If they decide to buy some corn, it can take prices higher than you know other, you would otherwise expect. So there's some things on the horizon here that that I think could be supportive to corn. I personally can't get excited about selling new crop corn. Well, really, under 405 to 410, okay. uh, would really a lot be a lot happier to be in the four and a quarter to 450 range. Um, so, I, you know, under four, I'm I'm not all that excited about selling new crop corn. Just a watcher. Now, what do you think the trade is anticipating for acreage? What number do we have baked in? Are we at 92, 93 million acres? They're looking for about a two million acre in de decrease, okay. I think. And so, 94 and change to maybe 92 and yeah, change. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. But here's the thing on that. We did some calculations that you, you lower acreage 2 million acres. You come in with a reduction in yield, but still up at 170 and around trend line. Okay. 
we're probably way overstating exports. I mean, I mean ex exports this year aren't probably going to be duplicated next year because of that safrina crop, the second Brazilian crop being so large. So if you back that down a little bit, bump ethanol a little bit, leave feed usage same to slightly higher, the bottom line on that is you build carry out from 2.3 up to 2.6. Okay. So let's not let ourselves get too carried away. I mean, we know we can grow corn. We've got your, your little report earlier showed this, this drought monitors right. not showing a lot of troubles. So, um, you know, if those rallies come along, don't think you're going to five right away. Uh, use those to, ma to make some sales. All right. Looking at the soybean market, again, good solid week to the upside. Both old crop and new crop. Are we going to see that continue here into next week? If we set the stage for a continued rally? Oh, well, I guess I wouldn't surprise to see it continue in the next week. You know, we've been, we're in the trading range, and we're we're still a little bit below the top end of that trading range. So I, I, the, the way we closed, I wouldn't be surprised to see us go up and nudge that again. Uh, once again, uh, ample supplies of U.S. beans, uh, Brazilian it, Mato Grosso is what 45, 46 percent right. harvested. Normally, only 25, so they're well ahead which also plays in that safrina cop. As soon as they get that out, they can start plugging that in. Um, and, and I mean, you hear all kinds of big acreage increases in the U.S., as much as six million by some people. It's just the upside here on, on new crop beans is, is pretty limited, I think. Okay. The old so, crop, may, maybe a little more. I mean, the farmers sold out. The U.S. farmers aren't selling qu quite as much because they've sold already quite a bit. Uh, the Brazilian farmers have also been reluctant sellers, and that's been helping support mm -hmm. that differential at the gulf between our, uh, Brazilian and U.S. beans. I think that's part of the reason why you saw some bean sales announced this week was that, you know, you'd expect with their harvest progressing right. like it is, the prices would be well under U.S. and 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 we'd be losing business yeah that has that's probably going to happen uh, almost definitely going to happen but it hadn't happened yet okay so old crop beans up here around 10 10 how aggressive should a producer be oh I, excuse I, me new crop new crop beans oh i i, th I think you, you should probably should be 40 to 50 percent sold on new, okay. new crop beans up here i mean I, i'd be pretty aggressive on like I said, not so much on corn, but certainly on new crop beans. All right. Especially well, if you're one of those people that's going to plant more beans this year, that, then uh, you'd really want to get those sold, I think. If you're making that decision based on the economics, let's capture that economics. Exactly. All right. Let's talk livestock. We had a little bit of a pullback this week. Good, strong cash prices here at the end of the week. I, I heard 120. Room for the futures market to rally? Oh, I, I think so. And, and I think we talked about it and it's kind of in the market, but that 16 pound uh, reduction in weights on the, on the fat side, that, I mean, ha having lower weights is always a good thing. That means people are staying current, they're getting the cattle moved through. Um, and, and, you know, we had a terrible close really on Friday, so you might see some sell off from that. But I, I wouldn't want to let, get my, let myself get too carried away with that. I still think you've got a chance uh, late March. Uh, of that April contract moving up into the 118 to possibly 120 level. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I mean, we got a little negativity here short run, but probably not for long. Okay. Well, defining the long term as the end of March. Right. So we're looking yeah. out six weeks before yeah. we can maybe get a substantial two, three dollar move to the upside. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, feeder cattle, again, a setback. And we did see that strength in the corn market, plus the, the drop in the fat cattle prices. Is that going to accelerate, that drop in feeder cattle values as we get here into the true calf marketing season of spring? Yeah, if, if corn prices keep going up, that certainly isn't going to be helpful. Now, if the fat market rebounds, the, those, those guys that buy feeder cattle get optimistic really quick. <laughs> So, I, 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 you know, you could see a rebound in that market back up in the upper 120s, I, I don't think without too much trouble. So, I, once again, you might have a little pullback as corn creeps up here, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't get too carried away making sales down at these levels. Okay. And if the, pack, or if the, if the feedlot operator's in the black, you're right, he's going to sit at that sale ring and put his hand in the air. Yeah. Well, I want to turn to the hog market for a little bit. We don't get a chance to delve into it very deeply that often, but we've got a question here from one of our Twitter followers. We encourage all of you to check us out on Twitter and on Facebook, and you can find us. Just search Market to Market. This one came from Ben, and he's on Twitter at BJ underscore AMA42. He says, let's talk hogs. Hog cash index and cutout are at a premium to April 
Where do you see the April contract moving? Well, it's going to have to work higher. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think there's any question about. It. I mean, it, we had a, again with some of the technicals rolled over a little bit at the end of this week, but I, that's probably setting up a, a, a correction. That at, at, it just looks like that the, the April and the June hogs both want to work higher and are probably going to. Probably I mean, going to export, see that uh, correction. You're looking for another. Would it be a five or six dollar correction before we rally higher? No more than that. Okay. And what do you see on the upside? I mean, given the demand that's out there on the cash side, how far can this thing run? And let's talk April specifically. Well, I, I don't know that we know that, but it, I, you could certainly go in the mid to upper 80s. I mean, I, I think there's there's a lot of potential. Unless there's some dust up on trade issues, geopolit some geopolitical firestorm that hits us, I think we're going to keep exporting at daylights out of pork. Uh, demand domestically has been pretty good. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to get too bearish uh, the hog market in, at these levels. Wow, what a turnaround in just six yeah. months from mid 40s to push in 90, mid to upper 80s on the April. Would the June then have a little bit of a premium to that? You expect to see it yeah. tap yeah. in that yeah, $90 that, dollar mark? Yeah, okay. it sure looks like it's going to. Wow. And, and you've got, once again, the, the cattle market or the livestock markets are beneficiaries of fund buying. And they seem to, they, they want to buy a bundle of commodities as an inflation hedge. And, and, and I don't know that any one of those, the commodities we talk about, are necessarily by themselves an inflation hedge. But the package, uh, uh, the, the perception seems to be that the package could, could be. So. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on those funds as they play in the market. Right. Thank you so much, Tom Fitzmeyer. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Tom and I will keep the conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. While you're there, check out Market to Market Classroom, where you don't have to be in school to learn more about the science, technology, and business of farming. And join us again next week when we'll take a look at a family business that pours it all into home delivery. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.